This is Altered Gas Exchange and Respiratory Disorders Part 2. Um, these are three different ways to administer oxygen. Uh, notice the difference of the percentage of oxygen that you get. So a simple mask can give, I think these are optimistic, but up to about 40%, where a nasal cannula, you're only getting 4% per liter above room air. Um, so it's really not that much. And then the non-rebreather, you can give up to 100%. Also, think about how much you need blowing in there. That simple mask, you've got to clear out all of the expired CO2. So minimum of six liters a minute to be able to use that. Nasal cannula, maximum of about four liters a minute. And really, most people are uncomfortable even at that. Uh, kids, we usually start about one liter, go up to two um, we don't often go a lot higher than that. The non-rebreather, you've got to have that bag inflate and be able to take a full breath without totally using up everything in the bag. That's the reason you can get 100%. So that should be at the very top of um, your O2 control. So 12 liters, 15 liters, whatever your top is. So acute uh, infectious disorders, the common cold, nasopharyngitis or URI, upper respiratory infection, all mean the same thing. This is a virus. We treat the symptoms. Tell parents to get a good humidifier, cool air humidifier that will help keep things thin so that they drain and don't occlude the airway, but it's going to last seven to ten days. There really is nothing to do except on a baby suction their nose before they eat so they can, can breathe and eat together, but antibiotics are not going to help flu as well. Um, this is also viral. Can be prevented with a flu shot. It's rec Shots are recommended for everyone over six months, but the flu is different every year, so you need a new flu shot each year. We do have some antiviral drugs um, that will lessen the duration of the flu by about a day. They're not super um, effective, uh, but they're not effective at all unless you start them in the first 24 to 48 hours of symptoms. With both of these, we want to make sure kids stay hydrated. That increased respiratory, you've got increased insensible loss. And if they're not eating well at, or drinking well, they're, they're at risk for dehydration. Tonsillitis, pharyngitis, right? This is swelling in the throat and in the tonsils. It can be viral, so no treatment some Tylenol just for, for pain, a humidifier to try and thin the secretions that are stuck on there, or it can be bacterial. And this is our, our strep throat, right? It's streptococcus, which needs antibiotics. We treat that usually with um, a penicillin. Kids who have chronic recurrent infections of, of uh, tonsillitis, bacterial tonsillitis, strep throat, their tonsils are so overgrown, we're worried about them. If they swell, it'll occlude their airway, or they get an abscess. They become a carrier. The, the germ, germs are in there, even if they're not uh, showing symptoms. Those are the kids. We take their tonsils out. We do a lot of tonsillectomies. Not as many as we used to, but we still do a lot. So after surgery, these kids are getting sent home. This is an outpatient surgery, so we've got to do good teaching sending them home. We are worried mostly about bleeding. They develop a scab there. If that scab comes off and they are bleeding, you're going to see them swallowing a lot. So we're telling parents to watch for that frequent swallowing. It is a pretty uncomfortable surgery, so pain control um, with acetaminophen, at Tylenol, ice collar, and eating soft foods and nothing like um, orange juice, you know, things that are not, don't, Avoid things that are very acidic. Uh, we want to keep them on soft foods for quite a while. We want those scabs to heal, not get scraped off. So um, we're in no rush to get them onto solid foods. If they do bleed and swallow a lot of blood and vomit it up, and they've just drunk red Kool-Aid, you don't know if that's blood or Kool-Aid. So the recommendation is to avoid red and brown fluids, right? Brown um, kind of digested blood will look more brown. 
Here's a picture of some really swollen um, tonsils with quite a bit of exudate on them. Infectious mononucleosis, often just called mono, uh, causes fever, malaise, sore throat, the swollen lymph nodes, and so it often looks like strep throat in the beginning. It can be confused with strep throat. It's common among adolescents. People call it the kissing disease because it is spread by saliva. Um, but it is viral. Epstein-Barr virus is the most common cause of that. And like other viruses, it just runs its course and goes away. The problem is it lasts for weeks. And we want to let these kids rest. They are really exhausted and just need rest. Um, and as I said, the first early stage, it often looks like strep throat. Antibiotics don't help, right? It's viral. Uh, the complications that can go along with it, though, are enlarged spleen and enlarged liver. So if those are enlarged, they're no longer protected by the rib, ca rib cage. So any um, kind of contact sport could damage them and cause internal bleeding. These kids don't feel good. So usually they're not wanting to do contact sports, but we want to ensure that they don't until the the spleen and the liver are um, normal size and not exposed. Croup. This is um, inflammation of the larynx, trachea, and bronchi. So laryngeotracheal bronchitis happens between three months and three years of age, almost always viral. All our viruses can do this. They settle in here. Kids don't really get laryngitis where they lose their voice. Instead, they get this kind of bigger area that all gets inflamed. Um, what you often see with this is this crazy barky cough at night. The child will seem fine, then they wake up at night with this sudden onset of this weird cough, and during the day they're fine. They kind of sound like a seal, or, 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 kind of barky cough. Um, it usually lasts three to five days. Treat it with fluids and rest. Um, humidity will help. So running that cool mist humidifier during the coughing spells, a lot of people will go into a bathroom and um, turn on the shower and make the room all steamy. And that helps for some kids um, where some cool is better than the warmth, but it's worth trying. Um, if it's severe and they come into the hospital, we give uh, corticosteroids or epinephrine, um, aerosolized what we're worried about is it's not viral croup and is epiglottitis. This usually happens just a touch older, two to seven years. Um, this starts very suddenly. Most bacterial infections do have a sudden onset with sore throat pain and then difficulty breathing where you're going to see retractions. They're going to have trouble speaking, dysphagia. They're not coughing. They're usually drooling. They're keeping their mouth open and part of that is trying to breathe um, so they're not wanting to close their mouth and swallow so they drool and they are agitated because they are air hungry. This is life-threatening potential uh, for respiratory obstruction, for full airway obstruction. This is preventable. Almost all of these cases are haemophilus influenza uh, which is what the Hib vaccine treats or, or prevents. So kids who are immunized, we have seen so much less of this since the Hib uh, vaccine came out. So epiglottitis is a medical emergency. If it's suspected, if somebody comes in with croup and we don't know if it's croup or epiglottitis, do not visualize the throat. That putting a tongue blade, stretching everything, if you make it swell anymore, it can totally occlude and now um, they cannot breathe. So do not leave them alone. Do not place them supine. They're trying, they're sitting up trying to breathe. Uh, provide 100% oxygen in the least invasive manner. We don't want to stress them out any more than they're already feeling. Realize complete occlusion can occur and the only thing that can be done, right? Because this is the epiglottitis, so we've got to go below it. So a tracheostomy. So have that emergency um, set up available. Common disorder we see is bronchiolitis. The most common uh, cause is RSV. Uh, this is a virus. Um, what happens, the, the 
kids don't really get bronchitis. Everything's so close. It moves out a little farther into the bronchial, so you get uh, swelling. That's why it's bronchiolitis, not bronchitis. Swelling, that mucus fills up the lumen, plugs it. This, you get that air trapping like you do with asthma, where during inspiration, things can get in. Then as it as the airways relax and shrink a little on expiration, they can't get the air back out. So you get that keep expanding the lungs so there's no more expansion left. Uh, so our problem with this is, is gas exchange. We're going to see low twos and high CO twos. They do shunting. Um, they plug up some of the, the bronchioles so we're not using all the alveoli. Um, Infants can do very poorly with this. We do have a vaccine, but it's only given to high-risk infants, and it doesn't last very long. So it has to be given every few weeks during the um, RSV season to those high-risk infants. So therapeutic management, elevate the head of bed, makes lots of secretions, so frequent suctioning, oxygen, and then hydration. It's stinking hard for a baby to breathe and eat at the same time. So now they get dehydrated, so um, hydration. And as I said, we do have an immunization, but we only use it on high-risk infants. Um, these kids a lot of time end up with high-flow nasal cannula, which is what this picture is. High-flow nasal cannula and regular nasal cannula are totally different things. High-flow nasal cannula is very close um, to CPAP, continuous positive pressure. Uh, it, it's really one step below sending them to the ICU and intubating them. So it's much, much higher level intervention than simple nasal cannula. Pneumonia. Uh, this is inflammation of the lung perichyma. This can be a viral, bacterial, fungal aspiration. Uh, when we see it on an x-ray, we usually treat it as bacterial because we've got a pocket of mucus there perfect medium for germs to grow in. If it didn't start bacterial, it may very well end up bacterial. So um, we usually treat it with antibiotics. So cough, and they look like they're coughing from their toes. It's a really deep cough, fever. They look ill, struggling to breathe. So labored, retractions, tachypnea with nasal flaring, um, wheezes or crackles or decreased. And actually, while that consolidation is solid, they'll be decreased over there. There's actually no air movement in there, but because everything's so close, you're, what you're hearing is referred from somewhere else, but it sounds decreased. As the mucus breaks up, you start hearing those crackles and wheezes. That's a good sign. Um, even though it seems like it sounds worse, decreased in one area right over where the, the pneumonia is, is worse. So our treatment, again, hydration. Um, feed them if they're stable respiratory wise, but a baby who is struggling to breathe cannot breathe and eat. So we're gonna not we're gonna give them hydration through an IV, not um, orally until they're stable. Again, elevate head of bed. The simple things. Don't forget those. And then meds. We're usually doing IV antibiotics. Um, we do have uh, immunization. Um, for one common germ, but there are other germs that can cause pneumonia. And uh, pneumothorax, hemothorax, pleural effusion, we describe it by what's in the lungs, but this is, uh, your lungs should be kind of gray. You should be able to see um, little lines. If you look close enough, you're seeing little tiny white lines you shouldn't have solid white, and you shouldn't have empty black. Empty black is air, solid white is a consolidation and kind of a pneumonia. Um, so for these uh, things that can cause a chest trauma or surgery, intubation or me mechanical ventilation um, that does some damage, or chronic lung disease like cystic fibrosis, and occasionally we have just spontaneous pneumothorax, um, especially of athletic, thin, young males. And I'll stop there.